Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our weekend two at the Fellowship National Certificate uh, for a program that is ongoing five months for mediators in Kenya, running from the month of July to the month of November in the year 2021. This is part of the program on conflict um, transformation, and the endeavor is to be able to develop conflict transformation mediators and the mediators as speakers. Today's session, we are delighted to have Reverend uh, Dr. Father Peter Mbaro of the Catholic University of Eastern Africa, the director at the Center for Social Justice and Ethics. And as our weekend too, uh, Dr. Mbaro will be carrying on with his uh, lecture on conflict uh, transformation coaching, which is part of the virtual personal development coaching course that mediators are ongoing with. We will have the lecture and then we will be able to ask questions. Colleagues and friends, please feel free to post your questions in the chat and we will be able to handle them as we conclude the session. With that, we will start off with the words of the Kenyan national anthem, Wimbo wa Taifa kwa lugha ya Kiswahili, Wanchi ya Kenya. E mungu nguvu yetu, ilete baraka kwetu, taki iwe ngao na mlinzi, na tukae na undugu, amani na uhuru, Raha to Pate Naustawi. Once again, colleagues and friends, I invite you to our conflict transformation coaching weekend. This is weekend number two with Reverend Dr. Peter Mbaru at the, from the Catholic University of Eastern Africa Center for Social Justice and Ethics. Welcome, Dr. Mbaru, for this session. We may kindly request that you please start us off with a word of prayer and then proceed on with your lecture. Karibu, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wangari. So we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us all keep a moment of silence. Thank the Lord for the gift of this day. Almighty God and Father, we are grateful that you have given us a new day. You have given us the gift of life, the gift of our health, the gift of one another, and more so for this session that we are having on conflict transformation coaching. We ask you, God, our Father, to make us true mediators of your peace, so that where there is no peace, we may be number one, our champions in bringing it into existence, so that your kingdom of peace of justice may be experienced among your people. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much, um, Media Tawangari, for introducing us to this session, which is our second session. And um, in this session, we will be focusing on our R number three, because I remember last Saturday, Medito um, Angari talked about uh, three R's, because we looked at restorative justice, retributive justice, and today we are going to look at reconciliation as part of this process uh, of conflict uh, transformation uh, through our um, mediation. So I'm going to go through this um, presentation by giving a lecture, and that is entitled, or it is entitled Conflict Transformation Reconciliation Dimension. And this, I hope that uh, the data, I'm hoping that I'll be able to share today just to run the screen, if it is possible. Um, I'm hoping that you're able to see it. Amazing. Yes, Dr. Mbaro, we can see your screen. Conflict transformation, reconciliation dimension, yes, introduction. So that, uh, is, is that what you should I, be seeing? Yes, as I read through, then okay, you'll be able also to read through. I Thank hope you. that that is better. Thank you. Okay, yes, we can see. Very much. So I'm going to begin by with an introduction where we put it that when we talk about con uh, conflict transformation, we imply a process that helps people experiencing strained relationship to renew their relationship through reconciliation. 
this means that a conflict transformation is about moving from a situation where the parties in conflict have uh, reached um, peaceful settlement of their dispute to a new situation of healthy relationship. Uh, following this, we can affirm that conflict transformation uh, focuses on rebuilding uh, broken interpersonal relationships and ensuring healing takes place. It is worth noting that conflict transformation does not imply that we simply eliminate or control conflict, but rather recognize and work with its effects and setbacks in nature. Human beings are social by nature. They are created to enter into community with others, for they depend on each other in all social and biological needs. Hence, they interact with each other daily in the process. And in the process, sorry, and in the process, they find themselves in various forms of conflict. Hence, social conflict is naturally created by human, uh, humans who are involved in social relationships. Yet, once they, it occurs, it changes or transforms uh, those events, uh, people, and relationships that created the initial conflict. Conflicts change relationships in a predictable way, altering communication patterns, altering uh, patterns of social interaction, altering even what you can call uh, patterns of organizations and how they operate, and also altering uh, images of the self and of the other. A conflict transformation, therefore, is necessary prescription for conflict. And if left alone, all unresolved or untransformed, a conflict can have destructive consequences on the one hand. But on the other hand, however, we say, if handled well, the consequences can be modified or transformed so that self-image relationships and social structures improve as a result of conflict instead of being harmed by that conflict. In brief, uh, conflict transformation profess, uh, professes the goal of transforming the conflict into something desired in a longer time frame, uh, focusing not only on the content of the conflict, but more importantly, on the context and relationship between the actors. Those that we referred to in our last Saturday's uh, uh, discussion as offender, uh, victim, and even com community that is involved. This brings us uh, to consider as mediators the dimension of reconciliation, which definitely presupposes forgiveness in peace building, which aims at transforming the changed relationships. Let us look at reconciliation. In ordinary use, two terms are often interchangeably uh, applied to the same situation of strained uh, relationships, namely forgiveness and reconciliation. So many times when we hear people speaking, even in the course of discussion about conflict, they use these two terms, um, you know, interchangeably. But they are not identical terms in meaning, but they relate in their objective. So they have the common objective of once again mending uh, the broken relationship. But forgiveness and reconciliation are not identical terms, though they have the same objective. Now, taken from this uh, perspective, then we can put it that forgiveness means the mutual recognition that repentance of the offender and the acceptance by the offended party, the victim of the community, is genuine and that right relationships have been restored or achieved on the one hand. That is forgiveness. But on the other hand, we say that reconciliation is a term that is wider and derived from the Latin root word conciliatus, which means uh, coming together assembling or working together. That means conciliatus, it's a term that is used uh, to indicate that 
or to imply that people are ready to come together, communion, they are able to assemble community and they are able to work together, meaning they are ready to work uh, together in the community. The conciliation means further restoration of broken relationships. Like when Yahweh brought back Israel from exile into their land, he restored the broken relationship between him and Israel, if you go biblical. And he continued to be their God and they, his people. That is reconciliation on the part of God and his people, Israel. If we can look at when people of Israel were in exile because of their failing to adhere to the uh, divine law or the law of God. In this light, therefore, the conciliation refers to uh, the act by which people who have been apart and split off from one another begin to stroll or to march together again. And here, what comes out is they were apart, they were split off because of a strained relationship, because of the conflict, but they um, experience reconciliation and begin to march uh, together in life. Reconciliation is also used for healing because when conflicts um, occurs and when people are experiencing a strained relationship due to conflict, they are injured. And many times we say conflict injure people physically, if it is um, um, you know, a crime that um, touches on the physical well-being, it injures people emotionally, it injures people um, in, uh, you know, spiritually, uh, it injures people socially, and in all other dimensions of, of human life, even economically, politically, people are injured. Therefore, reconciliation uh, is used for um, healing. It heals, it improves the negative relationship and brings about a healthy uh, relationship. Reconciliation stresses the mutual relationship and its reconstruction. And therefore, what we find here is that the people are supposed to be experiencing cordial or warm relationship, mutual relationship, with reciprocal relationship. And relation, uh, re recon re reconciliation comes in to reconstruct that which has been destroyed as people interact with each other. Through reconciliation, the changed relationship is rectified for better. A relationship between persons or groups who formerly were at enmity with each other is transformed to one of a friendship. Further, we say that reconciliation means a renewed working together of those who had been separated from each other by conflict and were not ready to walk in life together or to experience communion that builds a community. Essentially, it means the restoration of broken relationships or the coming together of those who have been alienated and separated from each other by conflict to create a community again where they are able to enjoy social warmth and readiness to work together for integral human development. And this way, it is long term in its focus. And it's important we, we outline this that reconciliation is um, a long uh, term uh, project. It's not something that uh, you know, happens at the twinkle of a finger. Uh, therefore, uh, it is a concept we say that uh, reconciliation is a concept that stems from the real realm of interpersonal relationships in which individuals. Uh, families, uh, clans, uh, groups, associations, organizations, communities, nations renew their warmth and trust. They renew their warmth and trust after a period of hostility and uh, conflict, which may be overt or covert. And from the above, then, uh, given descriptions of these uh, terms, forgiveness, which we did not uh, add at length but uh, which will keep on coming in uh, as we discuss, and then reconciliation, then we can say that the relationship between these two terms, forgiveness and reconciliation is so close, and so it is scarcely possible to draw a definite uh, difference, because forgiveness is the first element 
within the process of uh, reconciliation. However, in the process of putting uh, them into practice, we can say that they are not identical because as um, someone by the name uh, uh, V.M. Uh, Simpson notes, one person can forgive another and let the memory of an injury fade away. Reconciliation involves the willingness of both sides uh, to assume the risk of relating with each other once again. And from this understanding, then, reconciliation is more comprehensive since it presupposes uh, forgiveness on the one hand. But on the other hand, is the fact that there can be no true reconciliation without forgiveness and that forgiveness has to be complete only when there is reconciliation. Let's look at the importance of reconciliation in our life as individuals, as well as uh, you know, groups or communities. Reconciliation through forgiveness uh, should characterize every day's community relationship in human community because um, men and women, as I had said there earlier, are created as uh, social beings. And therefore, when they come together in such of community, they are interacting with each other and they form relationships. Then those relationships between individuals themselves and between and among groups um, require that people consider reconciliation as a way of life. The willingness to forgive and reconcile starts first in the list of the things that make relationships work. A willingness to forgive and therefore get reconciled stands first in the list of the things that make relationships uh, work. All members of any human uh, community uh, should understand quite well that no fault uh, can be repaired without forgiveness. And this can never be if means to reach reconciliation are not employed. Uh, following this, then we have um, a teaching by the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace. You know, the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace is the one which um, propagates uh, justice and peaceful coexistence in human uh, society um, in the Catholic community. Uh, and puts it that, uh, or underlines that, the place of forgiveness and reconciliation as the decisive path uh, to conflict transformation for social cohesion, uh, for true uh, peace. Um, what they are underlining here is that the place of forgiveness and reconciliation as the decisive way uh, is important and cannot be ignored in any um, human community. Peace is surely compromised when the offended party does not go out to forgive and seek uh, to reestablish a friendly relationship. Despite the fact that the uh, council underlines the importance of forgiveness uh, for reconciliation of forgiveness and reconciliation, it however acknowledges that uh, it is not easy to forgive, especially when faced by the consequence of crime, war, and violent conflict. Because violence, especially when it leads to the very depth of inhumanity and suffering, leaves behind a heavy burden of pain. And this pain becomes a block in the way to community social living or social life and peaceful uh, relationships. As often at times, the offended party harbors a sentiment of anger, hatred, and uh, vigilance. And that is why, why we find that even when people in such situations call for justice, that means when, when people in uh, experience or having a heavy burden of pain, even when such people um, call for justice, if there is no disposition to forgive and reconcile, no matter what is done by the guilty party or to the guilty party, the desire for vengeance remains deeply rooted in the hearts of the offended party. This has made various forms of community uh, conflict 
and domestic violence assume a vicious circle. And that's why we are not able sometimes to break the circle of violence in certain communities or in certain families or even in individuals. Therefore, the council um, puts it clear uh, in puts it in clear terms that uh, this pain can only be eased by a deep, faithful, and courageous reflection on the part of all parties, a reflection capable of facing present difficulties with an attitude that has been purified by repentance. The weight of the past, which cannot be forgotten, definitely because of the memory, can be accepted only when mutual forgiveness is offered and received. This is a long and difficult process, but one that is not impossible. And I think this point uh, for my brothers and sisters, mediators, is very important the council is emphasizing here that people experience a lot of pain and they carry that burden of pain. But if that pain is to be eased, this is what is required, a deep and courageous uh, reflection on the part of the offended party, whether they're individuals or the communities or the families or clans, whatever, and then readiness to let that weight get off one's heart or shoulders through mutual forgiveness that is offered and received. It is offered by the one who has been offended, but it's also received by the one who had offended um, the, the other uh, party. And when this has happened, then people are able to experience slowly by slowly healing of their relationship. And once again, they're able to recover, you know, cordial and, you know, that mutual reciprocal relationship. This process, the council emphasizes that it is a long and difficult process as why the mediators come in in order to facilitate uh, conflict transformation through forgiveness uh, that adds up in re uh, full reconciliation. Since members of uh, in any human community find themselves in similar situations of conflict during their interpersonal uh, relationship, there is always an urgent need to be assisted through mediation. This is what I have said there earlier, and it's worth repeating it again, and in order to seek reconciliation uh, through uh, forgiveness. Besides, we, see, we note that since human community has strained relationships within itself or with its neighbors, it must be solved to seek uh, forgiveness for reconciliation always within itself and with others in an effort to repair broken relationships this is this is only possible if the members value the place of dialogue for reconciliation and embracing uh, of the process uh, to full reconciliation uh, as we talk about forgiveness uh, that leads to reconciliation uh, what we are almost um, uh, emphasizing is that it is a process that will definitely take a bit of time. It is long, but with uh, sweet fruits at the end. So let us look at uh, reconciliation as a process, where we are putting it here that reconciliation is, is a process. First, we know that in reconcilia uh, reconciliation is a process that entails one, confession, repentance, forgiveness of sins, and as we even see it in the spiritual realm, it is a means by which reconciliation with God and others is sought. It's a process where there is confession, and many times a confession implies, you know, talking about the truth or the truth telling, where the person who has been offended tells what he or she um, has experienced or has gone through, and the one who has committed um, the crime for that matter, also confesses. And then there is repentance where the one who has been offended and the one who has offended then also expresses that he or she is ready to uh, ask for forgiveness and is sorry for uh, the, the crime or the offense committed. And then forgiveness of that sin that has been committed is accepted um, especially by the one who is um, requesting for it 
and the one who is giving. Forgiveness and reconciliation presupposes each other, and their relationship is so close that it is not really possible to talk of one without the other. So it's a process. Forgiveness and reconciliation is a process, and we have to see it that way. In the process of reconciliation, forgiveness is the first element, though preceded by confession. And as we, we underscored there earlier, reconciliation is more comprehensive since it presupposes forgiveness on the one hand, but on the other hand is the fact that there can be no true reconciliation without forgiveness and that forgiveness has to be complete only when there is reconciliation. So forgiveness is a condition we say it's a condition um, without which reconciliation cannot be fully achieved. And if, as mediators, we emphasize this, it is important because we are saying reconciliation is a process and therefore forgiveness is a condition without which that reconciliation uh, cannot be fully achieved. And conflict transformation for peaceful coexistence then depends totally on this. It depends totally on this uh, process where forgiveness uh, precedes, uh, you know, reconciliation, and eventually people are able to experience it um, once again. In addition, every crime or every sin committed affects the holiness of God. We know that because for us, we have to always look at it um, also from a spiritual uh, perspective, not only a uh, social perspective. So. Every crime or sin uh, committed affects the holiness of God and affects the personal relationship with others, thus having what we call a social effect and ends up destroying social life and social capital uh, for that matter. Uh, because the community is affected, people are not able to come together, they are not able to experience friendship, they are not able to work in solidarity. So social capital is destroyed and social life people are no longer uh, you know, able to work together. They are not able to feel uh, that they form uh, one uh, community of life. Hence, the conciliation through forgiveness has both the divine and human dimensions. Maybe this is something that perhaps we can even deepen uh, in another uh, forum. So Christians, uh, and not only Christians, but even other people endeavor to reconcile uh, through forgiveness endeavor to reconcile um, through forgiveness has to be inspired by uh, God's uh, forgiveness of his sinful people. Through uh, God's forgiveness of human offenses against his holiness, God's human relationship is restored. And this restoration also implies that man-to-man -man relationship is also restored. So to receive forgiveness from God means also that one needs to be forgiven and reconciled with the community. And this is the social dimension of forgiveness and reconciliation realized between individuals, between uh, families or among families, between communities or among uh, communities. And hence, in order to realize reconciliation in human community that makes way for peaceful coexistence, forgiveness has four uh, practical uh, requirements that ought to be fulfilled by the enstreet parties. And it is important for us as mediators to look at this before, because we are there to facilitate um, uh, people who are longing for working uh, together again, uh, repairing their relationship. They need to look at, or they need to look at this for, because as we have already put it, it's a process. And the consideration being a process, it is important we look at this for the first one is that there should be the restoration of an attitude of love in the individual and in the community because wrongdoing is not a valid reason for not loving the wrongdoer. And of course, uh, that uh, goes in the area of uh, the spiritual maturity and spiritual growth that sometimes we say, even in our uh, spiritual life in our spiritual moral life that we hate the sin and not the sinner. Uh, that means therefore we need really to help uh, people slowly by slowly to restore an attitude of love so that uh, they may always look at the other person 
as one who is a candidate of love. And whatever he or she has done uh, should be, of course, detested. However, that person need to be looked off also. As, because it, again, as we say, it's love that renews. <clears throat> Since when an offense is committed, it injures the love relationship between two uh, key parties in given community, the offender and the offended, the restoration of an attitude of love is a prerequisite for uh, a prerequisite to the process of reconciliation. But it should be noted that a lot of effort is required in community life to leave forgiveness because human love, though rarely, if ever unconditional, can be enabled by divine grace to love with as few conditions as possible and to extend forgiveness against any injury. The second um, thing to be considered is that there should be the working through pain, anger, and alienation until both parties and the community, of course, is coming in, perceive that the repentance process is mutually satisfactory. Here we are talking about working through pain, anger, and alienation. In relation to working through pain, different techniques are availed today by the community. For example, we have what we call family to family apostolate or family to family social action where families are able uh, to journey with other families that are suffering uh, from conflict. That's what we call in uh, our Catholic community apostolate, family doing apostolate to another family in order to help that family recover from uh, the injury caused or the pain that is uh, caused by uh, a conflict. And other sciences like psychotherapy, uh, where people are taken through treatment uh, so that depression that comes um, due to um, a conflict uh, can be addressed so that people do not end up you know, having what we call mental um, health issues. Psychological support through counseling. Um, and this counseling, of course, we are talking about both pastoral and clinical counseling in order to repair the damages that may have come uh, due to uh, conflict. So in the process of reconciliation, the treating of that pain, that anger and that alienation can come uh, so that people are be helped uh, to work through. Then we say that for the following truths have to be uh, considered as we seek uh, to get reconciled uh, uh, with others, uh, reconciled and to reconcile others. That reconciliation is a process that requires moral compromise, uh, often painful, it's often painful and costly. It involves negotiating with one's memory in order to decide which memory uh, to be uh, to have the last word and they cannot be imposed. Even this uh, going through and hearing from this pain, from this anger, uh, from this alienation, it cannot be imposed. It has to be done slowly and the person being helped must be allowed to freely enter into that process until it, 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 the person is fully healed uh, from that pain, from that anger. And it is important to take it that it takes time. It cannot be rushed. We cannot say that it must be done in the next 15 minutes and that the consideration of this the pain or this anger is, is, is done. The third uh, is that no sentiments of vigilance. When offended, many victims harbor emotions of anger, as we have already seen, pain and vigilance. And therefore, there should be working against these sentiments of especially vigilance, because we know that violence is never a proper response. And as mediators, we have to always remind our people as we journey with them that violence is never a proper response. It is evil. It is unacceptable as a solution to problems. And it is unworthy of man because human beings have the capacity to rationalize. They have the capacity to engage their reason and suspend what you can call the emotional part of their being. Of course, we know that these two go together, but uh, it's important for us uh, to underline 
that when people follow the emotions of anger, what happens is they suspend uh, their rational, their, their rationality. And uh, later on, you hear people saying, I, I don't know why I did that. It was out of anger. It was out of pain that I attacked this person because he attacked me, or I attacked this person because he offended me. But if you happen to ask that person, but was there an alternative uh, to this attack? Then the person say, I never thought about it. That means it's like that person suspended rationality and to his action was all moved by emotions. So violence is a lie. We say violence is a lie. And it's important for us as mediators to always emphasize this, that violence is a lie, but it goes against the truth uh, of our Christian faith, of course, the truth of our humanity. Violence destroys what it claims to defend, the dignity of the human person, the rights of the human person, the life, the freedom of human beings. It goes against that. And it is for this that we need really as mediators, as we help people to go through um, reconciliation, to always note that violence is not a way not to solve problems. To live a value-oriented life, love, justice, respect, dialogue, forgiveness, reconciliation are values lacking in our society, which families and the young generation urgently need in order to assimilate um, uh, for peace, uh, to assimilate for peaceful coexistence and to learn the art of tolerance, dialogue, and conflict resolution and management and transformation, reconciliation and peace. And that nothing, uh, as was put by Martin Luther, nothing good ever comes of violence. And even Marine Mujurius uh, Nyerere uh, had even put it that violence is unnecessary and costly, and peace is the only way that is um, necessary and cheap in our life. Then the fourth is that there should be the opening of the future to appropriate relating with the trust and good faith that permits risk spontaneity and the possibility of further failure or conflict. As mediators, we have to help our people as we, we go through this process of reconciliation to understand that this should open uh, their mind, their heart, uh, to open uh, their life to a future of appropriate relating. But with this in mind, uh, that they are getting to a relationship once again with the trust and good faith. And but also as a way of uh, can I put it this way, taking risk, <laughs> because life is about risk. It's about uh, getting into that relationship, getting into it again, believing that it's going to work. So opening to the future. This requires a realistic approach to human life and interpersonal relationship, which understands that human beings are social beings in nature. And since they are called to be in community with others, they are not perfect in loving and are prone to fail. And therefore they require to give and to receive forgiveness always. Then the moment we engage our people and we also engage ourselves because we are also uh, to be in that uh, same uh, reality of life that we are opening ourselves even to the future. All members, as I conclude now, we say that all members of human community need to be helped they need to be helped uh, through uh, by mediators and other agents of social transformation to understand quite well that no fault can be repaired without forgiveness that leads to reconciliation. As a conclusion to our reflection today, we have affirmed <clears throat> all through that <clears throat> solidarity and peace building among uh, parties whose relationship uh, was formerly strained can be achieved only by reconciliation through forgiveness. As mediators, we are reconcilers by facilitating reconciliation through forgiveness. But one fact needs to be considered important that forgiveness and reconciliation in our families, groups, in our communities take place only when people are open to dialogue. We observe finally that love of enemy 
uh, those who have offended us means uh, trying to reach out uh, to other persons, expressing hostility, engaging them in the human interaction necessary to diffuse that hostility. So in exalting the importance of dialogue for reconciliation, we note that enemy love at its best is nonviolent. And maybe we'll talk about nonviolent action maybe later. Dialogue is the soothing oil for any injury uh, caused by any conflict. Hence, as mediators of reconciliation for peace building and peaceful coexistence in human communities, openness to dialogue is fundamental since it helps to dissolve animosity and conflict that sometimes add, uh, add in by, uh, various forms of violence that disrupting the health the interpersonal relationship and peaceful uh, coexistence in general. So next time, perhaps, we will consider the importance of dialogue as, or even how to facilitate dialogue uh, towards this reconciliation as a condition necessary in reconciliation, solidarity, and peaceful coexistence. And as a value that should be inculcated in the life of all in our communities. Thank you very much, um, participants, and thank you very much for listening to me. God bless you. Thank you. Back to you, Angari. Asante Sana, thank you very much, uh, Reverend uh, uh, Dr. Pichambaru, for uh, your sharing your very deep insights uh, in this particular segment of uh, Conflict Transformation Week 2. I think it feels like we, we have taken a parachute and gone to really another, you know, just another space. And uh, we really thank you for just uh, enabling us to get to appreciate when we talk about conflict transformation. What do we really mean? And um, um, it, it feels like as we uh, carry on with these conversations, this work becomes even more difficult because then it, it, it goes much further into tapping into the human being or requesting the human being to do things that are probably belong to God. Or we think the, that is God's, you know, it's, it's God who has that capability, really. It's, some of this feels like it's, it's only div divine beings that have that. But I think uh, from yeah from your presentation is that uh, yeah we are made in the yeah in the image of God and uh, we do have that divine uh, capacity and also um, capability. So allow me to uh, please be able to pick up with you on um, just a number of areas from your presentation, and then we will also reflect on um, a number of, um, uh, of of the of the of the papers that have come in from the fellows and just some key insights on them and just what your reflections are specifically with regard to um, the the three R areas we had been able to go through. Uh, restorative justice, uh, retributive justice, and also reconciliation, but more really with uh, reconciliation uh, mindset and as conflict transformation mediators, what this means. Um, so uh, firstly, you have you have pointed out that um, the, 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 there is the aspect of the vicious cycle that seems to be uh, just going on and on and on. And um, uh, we, we, we have mediation that takes place or even if not mediation, and, and let's say mediation because also our elders get very, very involved. Um, if we consider whether it's a family, a family matter and uh, the, the couple is, is, is having, is, have, is listed in, in dispute, you will normally find that the, you know, the elders will get involved and then Next year, again, the elders will come and get involved. Then next, the church, uh, Father Ambaro will be called. Then next, the friends will come in. It just seems like this thing is not, I mean, it's just going on and on and on. Probably it could be from the context of just what you have also said that it doesn't mean that, you know, it's a process. Eh? But um, yeah, what does this really mean? And uh, I think the bigger pro problem with this is that we are actually seeing some very, very drastic um, uh, actions. You know, we, we have families that are, have actually, you know, uh, been, uh, been killed all of them or some of them we have uh, some people who may be in jail because of some actions that relate to families and i'm starting off with family aware that even this has translated in business recently we had a very high profile case in kenya um, that involved I mean, uh, gun gun violence yet again you are telling us that um, i actually picked the statement that violence is a lie um, it seems that probably violence is not the lie. It seems probably that maybe this statement that violence is a lie may be the actual lie because on the ground, well, violence is, you know, seems to be the approach that um, is taken in. So as conflict transformation mediators, could you probably just speak to us um, from that context of, yes, this vicious cycle, where do mediators come in to just, you know, either clip it, be able to identify it. And then also secondly, 
uh, the, the aspect of violence, because it seems that, you know, they're so correlated, whether it's in families, so in business, they just seem to be coming together um, at once, and whether it's loudly known or not even known. So thank you, uh, Dr. Mbaru, over to you. Thank you very much, Medita Wangari. I think the first thing um, is to acknowledge that uh, there is what you call vicious circle of uh, conflict and even of violence. Um, the first thing to underline here is that many times we do not go to the context of conflict. We only go uh, to deal with the symptoms that appear as uh, when conflict is growing off and it's escalating, it, it, it comes over. That's the time we go and sometimes we only try to address uh, what we can refer to as um, the symptoms, the consequence, but we do not go to the context. The moment we fail to go to the context, um, we only deal with the conflict um, as something that has come up today and we need to deal with it today and uh, we are done with it. But we don't understand that even before it comes out openly, it has been simmering under for a long time. And if it has been there for a long time, how do we expect that we are going to deal with it today and we are done? In, in fact, I've seen uh, in the chat somebody uh, saying, can we uh, do it in one day? Can that mediation be done in one day? And then we say, we are done. No, it's not possible. It is not possible. That's why we have said it is a long process. It takes time. It consumes a lot of time. And I think the resilience of a mediator and the resilience of the group that is mediating sometimes is what uh, is lacking. And even when we like somebody has said, look at the vicious cycle of violence. Uh, every year we are having violence. Somebody has already uh, said, look at Laikipia, for example, where every now and then, every year there is, you know, we have to ask ourselves, how has this been effectively addressed? Remember last time we talked about effective and efficient address of some of these conflicts. And then again, who are the players in this uh, mediation? Are they people who are really interested in mediation or are they people who just come in in order, uh, let me put it this way, with all due respect, to carry their, uh, their pay back home because they have done their part. They have done what they have appeared. Uh, let me use that term. They have appeared and they have disappeared. And so when it comes to that, then the, the violence has not been addressed or the conflict, sorry, the conflict has not been addressed and therefore it will keep on recurring one and again, once and again. Again, let us also uh, take into account that violence does not pay. Uh, you know, the, we, we, we have uh, ex Swahili saying, uh, which says that dawa ya moto ni moto. Yes, but dawa ya moto, moto ukiwaka tena uchome tena moto, kile abacho kituatokea, basi tukiongea kizwa hili hicho, basi ni kumalisa kila kitu. Violence destroys even that which it tends or it, it, it claims to protect. And the, uh, the Council for Justice and Peace is talking from human history and human experience that when we engage in, uh, in violence and people uh, respond uh, in, 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 uh, by engaging violent uh, means, then what happens is that it destroys one, the human person destroys life, this destroys the dignity of the human person, and even those human rights uh, that are to be protected are equally uh, destroyed. So that's why we need to disarm this is the point. As mediators, we need to help our people to disarm their mind. To disarm, disarming of their mind is what is important uh, for us as mediators so that people can understand slowly by slowly that dialogue 
um, that leads to reconciliation of forgiveness and reconciliation uh, is uh, the only way out. But once people go into um, conflict uh, resolution process and management process, we use all those terms and transformation process, but they are meeting people who are already armed in their mind and they believe that violence is the way, then definitely it will now make that violence a cycle and it will never come to an end. That's my position, that's my take, sorry. Uh, yeah, that, uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Mbaru, for that. Um, and um, it, it just seems that uh, this there's a there's a marriage of forgiveness and reconciliation, and it's so strong. And uh, actually, just one of the questions that comes is, and and, and you probably have have just um, just touched on it when you say that uh, mediators should actually endeavor to uh, to support uh, now our people to disarm, you know, disarm their their, let me say their minds. And it just comes in, the, the question that comes is that, you know, so what makes someone forgive? What makes someone, you know, be reconciled, get, you know, get into a reconciliation process? What, and, and, and what disposition is that person in so that they can, or that community, what disposition are they in so that they can actually say, you know, we forgive. And yes, we, will, we, we, we are willing to be in that process of a reconciliation. So that it's not just a superficial thing. Uh, just for instance, the way you have said that um, the, um, we have uh, situations that keep recurring the vicious cycle, and it's probably because you know we've come on a job as mediators and we do the job and we get paid and go. But next year, and 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 we say this also uh, because I think this is a very important area that mediators need to um, start um, also. Uh, causing awareness in the country because we, we are aware that we have agencies in this country and we hear the agency has gone into the region, they have done a, a, a reconciliation process, they have sat with the elders and everyone else. And then it one day doesn't end, it's become just a cycle. Then again, there's you know, an invasion again into, into the other community um, relating to, for example, uh, cattle, cattle wrestling, especially cattle wrestling communities. And I think mediators, as mediators, we need to be able to ask ourselves, what's that that's not clicking? And what's our role? Either to just cause the awareness of it and also to be able to move in. So yes, uh, but Dr. Mbaru, what disposition is that that makes someone forgive and actually get reconciled? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> there are some certain things that we have already put there earlier. That um, one is that forgiveness for reconciliation, one cannot be forced. It must be embraced. It must be freely accepted by one, the party that has been offended, and also. It has also to be taken by the one that has offended. That's why we, talk, we have used the term given and received. But in order for this to happen, in order for this process to be complete, there is a lot of human formation that needs to take place. The formation of the human mind and the formation of the human heart. And that's why uh, I've said that there are, there are, there, there are people, organizations, or experts, professionals that must come into, into, into place. That's why we have talked about one, counseling. We have talked about psychotherapy. We have talked about uh, pastoral uh, care. All these have to come into uh, the picture so that they can journey with the person. Because here we are dealing with a human being. And a human being, as we often say, is made of body, mind, and spirit. And all these three must come together and a human person must experience uh, that um, harmony. And that harmony needs to be experienced even in a moment of conflict transformation. That's why a counselor who is an expert in area of psychotherapy or well, counseling psychology, an expert in uh, psychotherapy who is a professional, a person who is an expert in pastoral care, who takes care of the soul and who takes care of the needs of the human person as a spiritual being. When all these people come in, 
and we are able to combine effort, then we are able to generate this person and this person slowly by slowly converts. Let me use that term, convert, so that he does not continue propagating the same uh, trend of violence. So that slowly by slowly he is convinced or she is convinced uh, that what he or she is doing is going against the good of the human person. So it is not a one uh, person's um, endeavor. I, as Father Barrow, as a mediator, then I say that I have to go to this group and deal with this group alone and expect that I will see results immediately. No, it's, it's, it's a process. And that's why teamwork is important in mediation, especially in an area of violent conflict. That's what I'll put it. Or that's, how, that's how I'll put it. That teamwork is important. So that even when we are going to address these people, when we are going to address the situation, there is a combination. But of course, it, it, it takes uh, time to bring or to enhance uh, uh, this kind of uh, workforce. Thank you. Okay, um, yeah, th 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 thank you for that. And uh, well, I think that this is, uh, the, as I say, as we continue on with this uh, three hours, it just raises the bar higher and uh, higher, as they are not only on the, on the persons who have the dispute, but also on the, on the mediators themselves. So um, in just a couple of minutes, um, uh, we uh, colleagues, we will be closing this session. Um, uh, Dr. Mbaro, can, can you allow us to just run through a couple of the uh, topics that colleagues have for uh, uh, at the fellowship? And then you can just give us a roundup of just your views and comments on reconciliation from the context uh, the colleagues are, are, are writing from. And we say this because um, the, 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 the fellowship we are on is a conflict transformation um, uh, fellowship. The aim is to enable us to become conflict transformation mediators and also the articles that we are writing, for, uh, writing about should be able to bring out a framework or a context, a context what we keep calling your Einstein that is related to conflict transformation um, mediation. So we have a uh, trauma-informed mediation, um, like Keep Here for Peace. Um, this is by Njeri Njao. Um, just a comment, since community members in the Lekipia region are experiencing severe mental anguish arising from the seasonal conflicts, during the mediation process, the victims may experience dysregulation of emotions affecting the process. Um, I think we've talked about uh, some recurrence. So perhaps in Jerry Njao's statement should actually have been, you know, brought out a lot earlier in, in places like the Lekipia and also I mean, especially cattle rustling regions we have in Kenya. Um, yeah, um, so resolving disputes in Chamas, these are the community development groups through mediation. Uh, this is a topic by Philomena Chege. The greatest threat to the success of Chama groups originates from petty squabbles, which are not managed early enough and sometimes escalate into major conflicts resulting in loss of cohesion and group dis, um, disintegration. I think the reality of this is that uh, we are aware we may have been involved even in Chamas, which just I mean, started off with a very noble, um, a very noble initiative. And I mean, a lot of money either has been tied because of the squabbles. And so just the social development um, context that um, the Chama groups are supposed to be supporting, quite a number of them have been paralyzed because of um, squabbles. And I think that, and I believe that's what probably uh, Philomena Chege is um, alluding to. Uh, Joyce Kingori on the topic of child custody and co-parenting in mediation. This subject of child custody is complex because of the innocent children who are caught in between the parents' grapples. Um, quite a very sensitive topic, especially when you talk about the area of forgiveness and reconciliation, uh, because uh, this is uh, someone we have loved, someone who has loved us, and then things have gone sour and south. They know us left, right, center. We know them left, right, center. And so when we talk about it's time for separation or any of the situations, I think uh, so this is a very, very, it, it, these are probably a topic that needs just its own session alone, eh? mm -hmm. considering the, yeah, the, the, just the intensity and also just how much we uh, families um, are, are significant. And I think you mentioned Dr. Maru last time that uh, this is actually the area of your study in um, uh, for your for your PhD. So I think that we will be tapping into that um, in other in other sessions with you. Then uh, the other uh, uh, topic is uh, Isaiah uh, Kiplagat Meli. Isaiah is um, 
is 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 one of the uh, what well, is 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 actually a teacher and um, uh, part of the TSC um, or, or sorry the the the, the, the sorry the teachers yeah that oh yeah because he's teaching in a in a in a, in a school that. Um, is government, so he's um, a, a, probably a member of the TSC and is also a member of, let's say, the, the National Union of Teachers or one of the other unions. His topic is on infusing mediation in conflict resolution between the, the Teacher Service Commission and uh, the, Nas the Kenya National Union of Teachers for successful acquisition of edu quality education in Kenyan primary schools. So he says that uh, the Teacher Service Commission and the Kenya National Union of Teachers need a policy to ad adopt mediation to forestall uh, frequent labor disagreements to ensure that learners, especially in a public primary schools, are not disadvantaged by the time loss in strikes. Um, I think um, even when when uh, when um, um, Isaiah Meli has given um, that particular topic, uh, I do recall that uh, in his analysis, he actually uh, did point out that uh, from 1965 to date, uh, that uh, there have been a record of uh, of, of six times when when um, when there has been the, the Kenya National Union of Teachers has called its members um, on strike. Um, it's, he says a record of six times uh, from 1965, losing 90 working hours in over 18,000 public primary schools in Kenya. Now, quick mathematics. One school has probably 1,000 students. I, th I think that, you know, it's like paralysis to one county. In, and, and, and we just probably just ask ourselves just how Either this, we have become numb, you know, teachers have gone straight again. Okay, when, when they finish, they'll go back. Eh? And then there are people who will sit in and talk and they'll go back again. And then, you know, it comes back again because of the, um, the, the, the especially the collective bargaining um, agreement. Okay, so uh, Cecilia Naliaka Mayonge um, on the topic of the place of confidentiality in online mediation. Um, uh, this is actually a very, very uh, good area that Cecilia is actually bringing forth into the into the fellowship program. And uh, we say this because, you know, um, the, the, the use of now the virtual uh, mediation, just as we are having this virtual session, is is, is a new is, is, is a new wave um, uh, that, 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 that that is there. And these aspects of then confidentiality when it comes now to even the conversation of forgiveness and just generally reconciliation. I mean, people probably expect that, yes, as, as I speak peak in that in this particular session that we are having as as a mediation you know we are not having a gang of people um, uh, behind and so they are listening into now the things that i'm pouring or the person is pouring out so cecilia uh, naliaka says how do you attain confidentiality in online mediation considering that as the mediator you have no control over who can access the electronic devices in use by the disputants during this time as we speak now, we have no clue who is around any of us, and if that if there is or there or there isn't. And also, uh, these devices uh, come from Germany, they come from China, they come from you know uh, where yeah they come from uh, Jomo Kenyatta University. Uh, just I mean, we really don't know how much of it is tapped. And th th I think Cecilia just raises opens a can of worms, which again that needs another uh, whole session on itself to discuss. Um, so and, and lastly, just um, um, to highlight on uh, just the, the other one that has been picked uh, by the by the uh, by the moderators today is um, by Dr. Helen Joroge on mediation. Uh, says everyone wins. Uh, so the new median in the justice process. So everyone involved in a court case should consider mediation as the first option, as it's cheaper satisfying and fair. That's uh, by Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Helen Jaroge. And just points out, uh, if you may point out just one of the advantages of mediation, the advantages of mediation are evident. So one of them is that it preserves relationships. So mediation provides an opportunity to preserve rather than destroy personal, professional and business relationships. It increases interpersonal relations and understanding, which comes as a result of communication. Mediation is effective at allowing parties to vent their feelings and fully explore their grievances. The process enables the parties to hammer out a solution that is both sustainable and voluntary. Quite interesting because you've also read, just uh, right now you've pointed out that uh, forgiveness and reconciliation, you, uh, for, you do it voluntarily and you, it must also be, be received. So colleagues, so that is just highlighting a number of the um, topics by fellows. Um, this is just a reminder that uh, uh, to the fellows that are, uh, uh, the blog articles were due on August 30th. And then the feature article we have uh, two days to go uh, is due on uh, November 1st, so that then we can be able to have the uh, fellowship assessment day that will be held on uh, 
Friday on, on Friday, um, uh, the November fifth, uh, and that will be with uh, uh, William Agan, who is an ADR lecturer, and he will be supporting us with assessment of our topics, just helping us to build that conversation to be stronger. So please remember to make sure that you have sent in your feature article by the close of day on uh, the 1st of uh, November. Dr. Mbaroso, in as you get also into the closing, if you may kindly just give us what your thoughts are based on these topics that have been um, shared today. Thank you, Dr. Mbaro. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, um, Ladies of Angari. I think I may not be able to address each one of them, but I will say that um, in general, uh, that these are topics that are helping us to look at mediation in a different way and also to see the challenges that uh, come with mediation. Um, and especially uh, due to the complexity of uh, human conflict uh, or conflict among uh, people. Uh, why I say complexity? Because they are not um, conflicts that can be given uh, one way of resolving them and uh, transforming them. And therefore, uh, the topics that have been um, highlighted the questions that have come uh, from uh, the participants uh, today are going to help us even to explore and see what are some of these challenges and how can we respond to some of these challenges that we are facing in our uh, work as mediators. I think that's what I will say and let the members continue researching, let us continue reading. I am also reading a lot uh, because uh, uh, we are not uh, you know, experts in everything. Like for example, when it comes to issues of mediation on uh, online, then what happens, ICT, we are, we are not developers of the softwares. <laughs> Therefore, uh, the developers still have um, a way of uh, managing them. And therefore, it's not something that we can immediately give an answer to. When it comes to issues of um, mediation in a uh, uh, situation where the, uh, an, innocent, an innocent child is involved, again, we know that we really need to look at the, uh, the factors uh, involved in the process of mediation where such an innocent child is uh, involved. And that child who, as I said last Saturday, is only defended by the community because the community is the one which comes in to defend uh, the innocent uh, child in a dispute uh, between uh, two adults. And many other uh, topics that have, uh, have come up, we know the question of trauma, that's why we need also to bring in uh, those people who are experts in uh, addressing post, um, you know, violent trauma. Uh, what happens when people are going through a trauma? How is that trauma healing uh, to take place? We need also those people who are experts in that to come in when we can, as we journey together as mediators, we can get uh, some of these experts um, who can help us also to understand if it's a question of a trauma and how we are to address that. Because if we get people who are so traumatized, how do we uh, even help in mediation? Do we refer or do we keep uh, the, the victim? And can I say that, uh, believing that we can handle um, a very traumatized person or, you know, even in counseling, we talk about even not only, or not only in the counseling, but in other areas of life, we talk about the powers. Why do we refer and when can we refer? We, we need to, to help to get people who can help us in that. Thank you very much. Oh, someone was asking, do we have a mediation um, center in Kuwait? Uh, that question. Uh, we are trying to work uh, towards having one as we work with the Wasiliana Hub in order to have a center that will help us in uh, handling uh, conflicts. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Mbaro, for uh, your, your remarks and uh, also just for sharing us with this, uh, uh, these particular topics. So colleagues and friends, we have been able to be to, to cover the the third R the three R's um, in this uh, uh, in this in this uh, conflict transformation coaching uh, programming and uh, uh, Dr Mbaro, we are really grateful because uh, the the context that uh, we, uh, we take the approach of this work is that uh, conflict coaching 
is also one of the very, very significant and important areas um, in, um, in, 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 in the area of enabling people to resolve their disputes much better. Uh, in Kenya, we have the gap because we do not have uh, conflict coaching as one of the uh, of the areas that has been has been uh, well developed, and uh, we believe that as we carry on with this particular work, that uh, we will be able to develop uh, conflict transformation coaches or conflict coaches who can be able to now just do what you've mentioned um, at the end, assess a situation, be able to guide and advise. At where do you need to probably uh, um, uh, uh, go uh, 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 at any particular point? Is the mediator the appropriate person to sit with all through, or do you also need to, you know, go to other professionals? Do you probably need, um, yeah, a psychological counselor? Do you need a lawyer to be able to come in? Do you need an accountant to be able to come and advise, uh, um, advise you? Do you need an investment? Uh, manager to be able to come and advise. We really believe that it is uh, bringing together, you know, a cross section of professions, and we trust that uh, that with that we will be able then to support people much uh, much better. So, colleagues and friends, uh, we are getting to the closing, and we will uh, be able to close with uh, the words of the Kenyan national anthem. And um, I will guide with uh, Wimbo Ataifa. Then we can close and uh, for everyone. Please do have a blessed day and uh, thank you for joining us. A reminder to the fellows that um, our next, uh, we have a session on Friday, that is the November uh, the 5th. And this is the fellowship assessment day. Please make sure that you have sent in your uh, fellowship feature written article so that then it can, you can get the support to be able to uh, uh, have it assessed and we, as we can be able to graduate. Uh, we are looking forward to the graduation, which is on November 19th to 20th um, of uh, this month of November at the November Leading Summit. And that is when fellows will be able to make their presentations based on the feature articles that you have uh, uh, submitted. So Asante Sana, we wish you all a very good day and we close with the words of the Kenyan National Anthem. And please make sure that you are you, you uh, sending all your articles to the Wasilian Hub you have the email address which you use for uh, or for receiving correspondence um, from Wasiliana Hub and also which you use to correspond to Wasiliana Hub. So with that, Wimbo Ataifa. Oh God of all creation, bless this our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace and liberty, plenty be found within our borders. Asante sana, sikunjema na dawa ya moto sio dawa ya moto ni moto kwa hivyo it is our responsibility to make sure that uh, we enhance forgiveness and reconciliation in all our mediation processes asante sana mm -hmm. dr mbaro and wish you a blessed day and karibu awesome. um, sana and allow me to just uh, also just highlight that uh, this is your birthday week and uh, as mediators, we wish to wish you a very, very good and blessed Happy New Year as your year starts off now. So happy Thank birthday, you. Dr. Mbaro, and may God Thank bless you. you. Keep you well, and his, his light shine upon you, and thank you for supporting us. Happy birthday, Dr. Mbaro. Thank you very much. Asante, 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 Asante sana. Thank you. Okay. Bless you. Asante sana. Ciao. Okay, bye-bye. Have a good weekend. It shall be.